headaches, heart disease. The way you think, the way you go about your life. It taxes you one way or another. Stomach aches, I mean, it all depends, your nerves. Stress is the number one killer out there right now. My name is Diane Beltran, and I've had chronic pain for over 15 years. I was just diagnosed actually three years ago with fibromyalgia. My pain level right now is probably the worst it's ever been, and I also have the most stressful job that I've ever had. I'm an educator for a clinical educator for a hospital, and it requires me to work as many as 60 hours a week, which decreases the amount of time that I have for myself, that de-stress time. Welcome. Today we continue with our series on stress. The goal today is to look at how emotions, thoughts, perceptions can lead to diseases and lifestyle practices that can help you to stay healthy. With me, I have Diane Bertrand. Yes. You were in the video. We will talk about that in a little bit, and Dr. Covington, a psychologist, and I understand that you've done some work with chronic pain and stress. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, as a psychologist, I'm interested in how mind and body affect basically health, and that on a preventative level as well as what it does over time to a disease level. Now, Diane, you have fibromyalgia. Yes, I do. And your stress level is like right up here. You said that in the video. How are you managing that with fibromyalgia? Well, I don't think I'm managing it very well because I, I think if I was managing it better, I'd have a lot less pain. Right. But I know that the job that I have is, is very stressful and um, some of the things that I have to manage are very stressful. Some things in my personal life are a little more stressful than right, they have right. been also. And my pain level is higher. But the, the one thing that I have incorporated recently is I'm making sure that I get at least eight hours of sleep every night. Right. And that's helping a little bit. I know you said in the video that you had this uh, pain all the time. You did not know what you had. And fibromyalgia can be a tough disease to diagnose. It's a diagnosis of exclusion. You exclude other diseases. And then you come to that conclusion. So how was it for you going through the stress of not knowing, but yet experiencing pain? Oh, very frustrating. Mm -hmm. Coming up. There are many theories out there about fibromyalgia. Some healthcare providers do not even think the disease exists. Then later. Well, your mind, body, spirit, or mind, body techniques are actually very powerful for these arenas of chronic pain. Five years ago, I remarried, which was a good kind of stress, but I did realize that my pain level increased during that time as well. And then being part of a blended family always gives you more examples, more opportunities to have challenges and stressful periods. And so over the past five years, I've noticed that my pain level has really increased. My pain level right now is probably the worst it's ever been. And I also have the most stressful job that I've ever had. Stress and fibromyalgia. I, I was just diagnosed actually three years ago with fibromyalgia. I didn't really know what the pain was. I just knew I had something and then it, it, it was labeled fibromyalgia, which was frustrating for me because I thought that it carried somewhat of a stigma, stigmatism that it wasn't something that we could take care of or I'd end up having to go to a psychiatrist to have, have my pain taken care of. Tried all different kinds of medications. Um, the things that helped the most to relieve my stress were maintaining a level of exercise when I could do that. Um, and trying to keep my stress level down. If, if I knew I was going to have a stressful day, I wouldn't compound it 
by adding something that was even more stressful. I can see over the course of the last 15 years how my stress has changed and increased in different areas. Even stress that I thought I was managing very well, but I think it was manifesting in, in a greater amount of pain. There are many theories out there about fibromyalgia. Some healthcare providers do not even think the disease exists. Now, there is this one theory that comes to mind. It says that fibromyalgia is brought on as a result of emotional stress that manifests as physical chronic pain and that can lead to anxiety and then with anxiety you have pain so it becomes a vicious circle that affects the mind and you get emotionally stressed so it doesn't end so before i ask your your view on that what do you have to say about that theory as the pain started for me, it began with a job that I had that was very physical. And you are a registered nurse? Yes, I'm a registered nurse. At that time, I was working in a delicatessen in a grocery store. Mm -hmm. And I was lifting a lot of heavy, heavy bowls and, and products. And so the pain started in my arms. It was a very stressful time. I was in nursing school, single mom, mm -hmm. two little kids. And it just progressed from there. So are you agreeing with this theory that probably the pain, emotional pain, contributed to or maybe led to the fibromyalgia? I think it absolutely contributed to. Really? I don't know if that's where it exactly started, right. but I'm sure it contributed to. Right. Now, Dr. Covington, explain this better. What, what is the connection here between this emotional stress and physical manifestation of chronic pain? Well, chronic pain in itself is, you know, different than a, just acute pain. And chronic pain is something that's, you know, unremitting and gone past three or six months of time. And it's the body not basically getting to a point of recovery or healing. And so it continues to cycle upon itself. And then when you add in anxiety or other of this, where you're not managing stress and it's hitting your body, you are ramping up constantly in a sympathetic or a fight or flight kind of arousal. And it's right. a wear and tear on all your <clears throat> systems. And it just in each individual, it will emit or manifest at some point because our body has intelligence. And if we don't stop and pace, mm -hmm. it will stop us. Mm -hmm. And that's basically where chronic pain, particularly fibromyalgia, will stop you. So if I'm understanding you correctly, if you're ex experiencing high levels of stress and you're not managing the stress, potentially it can manifest as chronic pain. Yes. And That's... it doesn't even have to be high levels. It may mean that you're just not good at managing stress. Really? It can even be positive stress and you're not managing it well. Absolutely. So Diane, what are you doing right now to manage your stress? Because if uncontrolled stress can potentially bring on fibromyalgia, uncontrolled stress can make it worse. So what are you doing to prevent the disease from getting worse? I'm trying to stay connected with uh, my particular manager right now and let her know what areas of my job are stressful and what, what other things we can do. Right, so now Dr. Covington, fibromyalgia is a difficult diagnosis to reach. So what advice do we have for others who are probably going through extreme stress and they are very tense and anxious and kind of borderline, you know, feeling depressed? Well, your mind, body, spirit or mind, body techniques are actually very powerful for these arenas of chronic pain. And it doesn't take a lot. In fact, um, you can adopt kind of a three minute practice a day and you can engage in a mind, body intervention in 60 seconds. And then basically we find that in six seconds it can take effect faster than really any medication out there. Absolutely. Well, let's take a break. When we come back, we will talk more about the mind, body, spirit, lifestyle practices to help you to manage stress and prevent diseases. Stay tuned. Coming up. The, the idea of my body is to basically take an individual or an organism out of the stress reaction, the right. sympathetics. Then later, stress will also increase cholesterol. So we have obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, and cholesterol. So today we will talk about some things that you at home can do to prevent this from happening to you. So Dr. Rui, let's talk about some practical tips and help us to better understand what is going on in the body. Okay, I have uh, eight quick tips and you don't have to use all of them at the same time, but you can use one or two of them a day. Okay, so you have, oh, uh, you have, you have a, uh, it's a, it's a buffet of stress reducers. It's just a couple minutes yeah. to bring down the stress load. Yeah. And so it's an intervention as well as preventative. My name is Sherry King. I'm a pain management specialist. I've been a registered nurse for 20 years. And so this experience has given me the opportunity to see the effects that stress has 
on pain, especially chronic pain, throughout a person's lifetime. Well, we certainly see that in times of heightened stress, patients do have, experience much more pain. Um, they're less able to relax, the tense muscles, the decreased resp respirations. Um, lots of things in times of heightened stress make it more difficult for patients even to manage their pain and accentuate the sensation of pain itself. So patients who are in higher times of stress also seem to find less time to exercise, walk, interact with their families, read, um, connect with their God. The things that help them feel better about life are harder to do during periods of stress. Patients have a di more difficult time managing their pain during times of stress from little things like forgetting to take their medication to bigger things like not taking the time out to do things that are good for their bodies. These types of patients that have more control over their physical and emotional stress seem to really regulate their pain. They, they have a way of being with their pain without having their pain cause their suffering so much. And that in itself, giving into it, has a great effect on lowering the pain sensation itself. Welcome back. Today we're talking about chronic pain and stress, fibromyalgia. And with me now is Sherry King, a registered nurse for about 20 years, mm -hmm. and you are a chronic pain specialist. Yes. So you've seen a lot of emotional stress manifesting as chronic pain. Tell me more about that. I know in the video you talked about how patients who have better control of their stress are better able to manage their pain. I mean, that is obvious, but right. yeah, tell me more about uh, your experience. Um, what I have seen is that, as you say, patients who are able to control their stress really do tend to um, monitor their pain much better. So as I, I mentioned before in the interview, patients who um, are resting more, are playing more, are finding time for family as well as friends and right. their work um, also tend to do the things like sleep. Right. take their medication, um, exercise, do the things that they need to do to feel better overall. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, before the break, Dr. Covington, you were talking about some simple things that are just as effective as some medications. The, the idea of mind-body is to basically take an individual or an organism out of the stress reaction, the right. sympathetics, and bring yeah. them into what we call the parasympathetic response, yeah. or the bring on a relaxation response, which is one of the main pieces of mind-body. Right. And so, for example, just taking a diaphragmatic breath, if you know how to do diaphragmatic Deep breathing. breathing. And it's, it's, it actually, the brain registers very quickly Absolutely. with that breath, and your hands can start warming, and you can start going back to rebalance. Most of the time, the issue with stress is that we compound it through the day. It just adds Absolutely. on, it cycles, and then we add yes. the other things like anxiety, right. our perceptions, our thoughts. Right. And in that is where it never comes back to rebound. We don't get back to baseline. Right. So we come home at the end of the day at the peak. Diane. Let's talk about some of these techniques she just talked about. Any, are, you, are you trying any of these? Oh, absolutely. I know that when my hands start to feel really cold, they're actually cold right now. <laughs> um, I, I do that very thing. I do the diaphragmatic breathing, and it's almost like a little game of biofeedback where I'll take some deep breaths, right. and then I'll notice my hands start to get warm, and that's my way of de-stressing throughout my day. Right. The pain sensation alone it can be stressful. And then if you're worrying about that, you add more stress to it. Right. Especially when you feel like you have a lack of control with it. So what advice do you have for others? Oh, it's all about balance. Yeah. We would say the things we mentioned before, rest, Diane talked about rest, we've talked about play, time with friends, time right. with family, not just work. Um, attention to what's important to you spiritually, physically, right. emotionally. Absolutely. The other thing that I learned from you, you told me at one point, go ahead and feel the pain. Go ahead and feel it. And, and so I'll it. tell myself, go ahead, see how bad you can right. be um, and feel it. And then it really isn't bad as what, as what I thought it was. Again, it's a perception. Mm -hmm. So if you embrace the pain, if you accept the, the pain, that lowers your stress level. It really. does. And it changes the brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. Gives you control. I know we're running out of time. Let's talk briefly about guided imagery. It's a powerful tool mm -hmm. to manage stress. And I know you, you're, you're heavy yes. into that. So. Yes. Guided imagery is very powerful because our, it works with our unconscious, which can't tell the difference between what is real or reality right. and what is image. So if you're imaging being at a beautiful lake and you're walking along a stream and you're feeling peaceful and you're hearing the birds and you're telling yourself you're at peace, your unconscious will assume the physiology to match that vision. Absolutely. Well, I want to thank all of you for being here and hopefully you will join me on the next episode. When we come back, diabetes and stress. 
bad combination. Stay tuned. Coming up. There's a specific type of anger management called um, type A personality anger management where people are actually not able to manage their anger in a very uh, rational way. They actually have emotional right. outburst. Yes. And that anger actually will cause a sevenfold increase risk of heart disease. This garden is actually called Reflection Point. I love to come here. It's a, it's a way to get away from work, to listen to the music, to just absolutely de-stress. I'll come here with coworkers. We'll have lunch together, listen to the music, listening to the birds in the trees. I love that. It allows my spirit to feel less suppressed, and I, I feel like my spirit is more expressed, and I'm more open to who I am and the calmness that I know is inside of me. Patience families and staff to have a beautiful place to come and sit down, debrief during their day, regroup, and have some time to have healing. There are some beautiful flowers, um, there are inspirational biblical um, phrases at certain points throughout the garden, hence the, um, the name Reflection Point. There are different points that you can stop at. I have type 2 diabetes and I've had that for probably 30 years. I've had diabetes since 1995. I've watched all the, of the uh, Bad Trigger series. I have had diabetes since 1998. I've watched the TV series Bad Sugar. I am a type 1 diabetic and it's taught me how I can expand my lifestyle. It's taught me spiritually how to monitor my stress. Um, it's taught me how when I have an onset, how to calm myself down, how to, my nutrition, how to exercise, and how I can fulfill my life without looking over my shoulder. They clarified everything that the doctor was saying, but at a more slower pace, and a very, to me, a very understanding pace to understand diabetes. One thing I loved about it, it was pointing out, you know, all of our new technologies and how the new, uh, where we think one way that we're we're advancing in our technology, however, it's causing more stress if we don't monitor it. Oh, I thought I knew, but I didn't. I had little knowledge, but that series expounded my knowledge. For me, a bad sugar have played a major, major, major important role in my life to control, to educate, and to teach others about diabetes. It showed how God operates through us and how we need to connect with God in order to make sure that uh, those sugars operate the way that they're supposed to. Bad sugar can teach you things that you know not of. It can help you expand your life. It can stop the problems, the health problems that you're going through. It can help you advance. Bad sugar. There was things out there that I didn't know, and since I watched Bad Sugar, it's given me a lot of information that will help me further out. Type 2 diabetes affects a lot of different things in your body, which I never knew about until I saw the, the uh, episode 7, 8, and 9. I really find it very, very interesting and very uh, knowledgeable for my health, how to understand, how to maintain, and how to eat properly to be able to control this disease, diabetes. It's taught me about nutrition, it's taught me spirituality, and it's taught me how to live my life and enjoy myself longer. I was able to reduce my medicine, and that's due to the fact of the bad sugar. Call 1-866-257-3471. Operators are standing by or log on to PreventiveCareWeekly.com and place your order. Remember, knowledge is power. Bad Sugar DVDs will give you that power over diabetes. Get it now. Don't miss it. To order a DVD, go to our website, PreventiveCareWeekly.com. So you are a nurse? Uh, medical assistant, back office? Medical assistant, back office. Front office insurance verifier. Mm -hmm. So tell me, uh, do you think eating junk foods, french fries, hamburgers, mm -hmm. has any relationship with stress? Uh, actually, the junk food tends to relieve my stress. It's relaxing. 
I think it's actually a comfort food. You're away from the office. It's not that far away. You can walk and get fresh air and sun. It's obvious it's unhealthy. You know, there's so many out, so many reports out there saying it's unhealthy. You know, this is probably like a million calories. But we get to a point where we don't really care because we just got to get out of the office. I don't think it really contributes to stress. A lot of other things happen with stress in your life. I think stress is hard on the body because when you're stressed, you're not worrying so much about yourself, about your own health. Welcome back. With me is Dr. Ree. Hi. You have a background in uh, stress. Mm -hmm. Tell the audience a little bit about your background. Uh -huh. Well, I have um, uh, uh, basic science uh, research that I did on stress. Okay. And uh, the, I have a PhD in cellular mechanism of um, what happens in the body in response to stress. Right. And uh, John Rule, thank you for joining us. You are a registered nurse and you have type 2 diabetes and you've had some experiences with extreme stress. We were watching the video. Uh, I went out and talk to people in the street about stress and disease. And you saw in the video, mm -hmm. some of them said that eating junk food is actually a stress relieving mm -hmm. thing for them. What do you have to say about that? Well, uh, stress relief and eating junk food are very, very closely related because <laughs> uh, junk food actually stimulates the pleasure hormone. Right. And when you're under a lot of stress, you're in uh, distress and you're in under, undergoing a painful experience right. uh, in your brain and in your body. And eating junk food will temporarily increase the, uh, the uh, you know, pleasure hormone. And so it's a temporary fix. Right. Even though consequence is uh, negative. Absolutely. So please don't eat junk food because you're trying to manage stress. That is not mm -hmm. recommended. But I can probably explain to you what actually happens in this whole process of using junk food as a comfort food. Yeah. to manage stress, but that's not the proper way to do it. Absolutely, and we will get to that later. I want to talk to you, John. You have type 2 diabetes, and I know you had mentioned to me earlier that you, as a registered nurse, you were under constant stress. Mm -hmm. And tell me how you think that led to your diagnosis of diabetes and hypertension. At the time, I was a week after my 40th birthday, I was working emergency medicine at Kaiser as a, as a trauma nurse and um, working long shifts very short period of time for lunch, so I'd run next door to, uh, to um, uh, Burger King and grab a couple of chicken sandwiches and a 54-ounce Coke. Uh, Not Coca diet. Not diet. Regular time. Coke. At the time. All the sugar. All the sugar. And one morning I woke up and uh, my vision was blurred. I drive down the freeway. As I'm driving under the freeway signs, then I could, that's when I could read them. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to get out and walk up to a regular street sign when I was doing public health and going to visit the persons that, my patients in their home. And, that, and that's how I, when I discovered that there was, a, there was a major problem. Wow. What about hypertension? Uh, were you diagnosed at that same time as well? It was a little bit later that I was diagnosed with hypertension. Okay. Now, Dr. Ree, obviously we know that uh, stress hormones work against insulin. They mm -hmm. prevent insulin mm -hmm. from regulating the blood sugar. Sure. So can you please illustrate to us sure. so people can have a better understanding of what's going on in the body okay. with the stress hormones and diabetes and anxiety. And all the different um, issues that, yes. are, uh, that Even go cancer. on. Sure. Yeah. Oh, okay, I'm going to put stress here. And stress is linked with so many different um, uh, problems or diseases. Uh, now, if the word disease, if you think about it, um, actually says, says it right there. It's disease. And stress actually causes disease. Okay? And um, yep. uh, there are many different um, uh, problems or medical issues that we can think about. Uh, stress actually will immediately uh, induce behavior like uh, junk food eating. Uh, and um, this junk food eating will actually uh, uh, potentially lead to obesity, okay? And obesity in turn causes more stress because uh -huh. of um, uh, the stress, physical stress on the body and also uh, uh, social issues um, that are linked with obesity. Absolutely. And uh, stress is also uh, linked with uh, high blood pressure. I'm just going to call it HTN, short for hypertension. Mm -hmm. And then I'm gonna also um, uh, link that with also diabetes, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, diabetes and uh, hypertension, obesity, they're all also interlinked, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, stress will also increase cholesterol. Mm -hmm. And all of these things will actually cause a number of, uh, number of issues. 
When you have a prolonged increase in cholesterol, you'll have heart disease. Mm -hmm. When you have prolonged high blood pressure, you're going to have stroke. Yes. And when you have prolonged obesity, you're going to have all kinds of problems like arthritis. Mm -hmm. And uh, obesity will actually uh, make diabetes worse. Yes. It actually will potentially cause diabetes. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily all the time, but potentially cause diabetes. Uh, this will actually aggravate high blood pressure, mm -hmm. aggravate arthritis, as I mentioned. And um, actually, uh, it's also linked with heart disease. And in, uh, in terms of managing stress, junk food is one mechanism, but another uh, way of managing stress is also having to do with um, uh, anger management. And there's a specific type of anger management called um, type A personality anger management, where people are actually not able to manage their anger in a very uh, rational way. They actually have emotional right. outburst. Yes. And that anger actually will cause a uh, seven-fold increase risk of heart disease. Yep. And uh, finally, stress is also linked with cancer because mm -hmm. it will reduce the immune system by, by reducing the function of natural killer cells right. which are supposed to defend our body. Right. And stress hormones, mm -hmm. uncontrolled stress mm -hmm. hormones can lead to heart attack because it causes the heart to work twice as much? Um, basically, um, there are um, a couple of hormones that are linked with uh, stress. One is uh, adrenaline, as, right. I, as I mentioned earlier Early, on right. the uh, earlier segment. And uh -huh. the other one is cortisol. Right. Now, adrenaline will cause the heart to work twice as much or right. sometimes, uh, you know, 1.5 times as much. Right. Cortisol. Uh, is a, uh, also a stress hormone that will actually thicken the lining of the artery. Right. So this will, uh, adrenaline will make the heart pump harder and so fatigue harder, have uh, lack of oxygen. Cortisol will actually cut off uh, oxygen supply by clogging the artery. Mm -hmm. So there's a two-fold mechanism by which heart attack is actually caused. Cortisol, as I uh, mentioned, not only actually thickens the artery, but it also actually leads to obesity because mm -hmm. cortisol tells the body right. to produce fat. Fat, mm -hmm. right. Even if you don't eat, if you're yeah. under a lot of stress, mm -hmm. cortisol will tell the body, tell the liver in your body specifically. Yeah. And it tells the liver, hey, make fat, and it causes the storage of fat around your belly or thighs. Right. So in a nutshell, now we have modern technology, you know how to eat better. So what are you doing to manage stress with your diabetes and hypertension? Exercise. Try to get more sleep because that's very, very, uh, very much important because right. uh, because that's the only time your body can re re regenerate itself. Absolutely. Um, exercise. Eat right. Uh, get more sleep. Uh, and try to develop more of a balance. Seek medical attention, seek spiritual help. Yes. All these things are very important. Okay, well, thank you so much for being here today. And Dr. Ria, thank you sure. one more time. Thank that you. is all the time we have for this show. Remember, for more information, visit preventivecareweekly.com. See you on the next episode. This program is not intended to be diagnostic or prescriptive. Please consult with your doctor or health care provider before adopting any of the lifestyle changes or other measures discussed in this program. We do not recommend any medication changes. Rather, patients should seek medical advice from their doctors or health care providers.